lesson this morning is one from James chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. You think about the idea, what it means to be a respecter of persons. Sometimes when you think about that, we think, okay, it's a person who has great deal of respect for other individuals, they're very kind, they're very respectful, those types of things. But that's not what we're talking about this morning. I want to show how you must be one who respects and treats all mankind equally. And that's the idea behind that kind of fruity picture up there with all the different colors and things is it doesn't matter where we come from, what background we may have, we cannot treat one another differently or in a sinful manner because simply based off of what someone may have, uh, what their culture may be, or what their skin tone may be, things of that nature. We all like to be treated fairly and like everyone else, don't we? You think about going back, some of us, it's not too long ago, think about going back to the college days or high school days, even maybe just in the workplace. And you have those groups of people that kind of get together, they kind of have their own cliques, and they treat others a little bit differently. You know, I've never really cared for that. I never really understood it either. Isn't there advantages to being a person who respects everyone, who treats everyone the same, who doesn't treat anyone differently, simply because of what their culture may be, of what their background may be? What does the Bible say about being a respecter of persons? Well, we're going to begin by looking at how a respecter of, pers of, of persons cannot be a Christian. You know, that really, someone said, well, that's a bold statement. You cannot be a Christian if you are, show partiality to someone else. Well, let's look at John chapter 7, verse 24. Christ says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. We think about what that means. He's simply telling us we cannot judge someone by what we see on the outside. Because appearances can be very deceiving, can't they? I remember being at a, a dinner there at the uh, school in South Carolina, the Central Carolina School of Preaching. And I was sitting around talking to some of the men, and, and they were asking me different things. And then they realized that I was actually one of the instructors there at the school. Because I was a little bit younger than some of the other ones. Appearances can be deceiving, can't they? So we cannot judge only upon appearance. We notice also that Jesus didn't treat people differently because of their occupation. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, the Bible says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You notice he does not pay any attention to what their occupation is, does he? You know, fishermen, I'll think about this. You think about, if you ever go, have gone fishing, you've been out all day, and, you're, and maybe you're one of those individuals, you have to clean the fish on the boat that you're on, or when you come up on, on, the, on the coast or on the land, you, you had to clean some of the fish out because the type of fish, sometimes you have to clean that quickly before you take it home, and then you finish doing the rest of it. That's not a pleasant odor, is it? It gets on your fingers, it gets on your hands, it gets on your clothes. You can smell it when you walk up. That's not a pleasant odor. But you notice Christ overlooks all that, doesn't he? He saw they were fishers, fishermen. He didn't care. He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You will catch men and do what? Well, we know, of course, he means he will show them how to save men from, their, from uh, hell. And teach them how to follow Christ. I'll make you fishers of men. I remember I've seen uh, a long time ago, I remember seeing an episode of, of, on television about, it had Ray Romano on it, and he talked about how one of his children his, had a friend whose father was a janitor. And all throughout the episode, they were kind of saying different things, they were trying not to be offensive to, their, to the son's, the father, father of the son's friend, but they kept saying different things, the little punchlines about, well, you know, that's the janitor's job, just throw it on the floor, this, that, and the other. Well, they weren't trying to show partiality, but in reality they were because of what they were doing, what they were saying. Christ did none of that in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. He didn't show partiality because of their social standing, Matthew chapter 9, and verse 10. Now it happened as Jesus said the table in the house, that, many, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. You think about this. And for preachers, we may feel a little more strongly about this than others. If you were sitting down and someone of the IRS came and sat down right next to you, you don't have the best opinion of them, do you? 
Or some of us, what if someone from the Social Security office came and sit down next to you? Or for someone from the VA hospital who we all know we have such high regards for sometimes. It's hard for us not to have an immediate opinion of them. But notice we see here in verse 10, the Bible says that Jesus sat at the table in the house, and that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him, his disciples. If you continue reading in verse 11 and following, he gets mocked because of the type of people who he's sitting with. But you know, he can't reach people unless sometimes you put yourself in the place where they are. You cannot reach the sinners out in the world by not allowing yourself to get out and be among them and try to reach them. And that's what Christ is doing in verse 10. They come and sit down. He doesn't get up and storm off and say, I can't believe you came and sat by me. He didn't do that at all. In fact, he rebukes his disciples and others for ridiculing him for sitting with those individuals. He was not a respecter of persons because of how others viewed these people, because of their social standing. We also see that in John chapter 4 that Christ viewed everyone the same. It did not matter their race or their culture they came from. John 4 and verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. If you remember, keep reading there, Christ says, If you knew who it was who was offering you a drink, you wouldn't be saying these things, basically. See, Christ didn't see so much that she was a Samaritan. He saw a woman who needed to hear the truth. You think about this today, Christ treated people the same no matter their past sins. For example, the thief on the cross. Did Christ rebuke him while he's on the cross? No, if you remember the thief, one of the thieves says, uh, rebukes one of the other thieves for ridiculing Christ. And Christ replies and said, what? Today you'll be with me in paradise. He did not care about his past sins. He cared about his eternal soul. That man was having a change of heart. Though he was literally on his death cross, so to speak, he was changing his mind and his way he viewed Christ. And Christ recognized that. If anyone could, Christ could. Christ loved all and died for all. John chapter uh, well, let's go to, I guess I missed that. John chapter 3, verse 16. We all know that one. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You notice the phrase there is universal. For, for God so loved the world, that is everyone, that whoever, that is anyone, believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Anyone can come to Christ and have eternal life. If you think about the sin of partiality, let's think about this. How would you like it? How would you like to be treated differently? One of the best examples and one of the most disgusting ones I remember was sitting in a men's meeting. Our congregation, which I was laboring with at the time, we were having our meeting in the office of the church building, and the phone rang. It's what we call a benevolence case. Someone needed some help. So I picked up the phone, was talking with them, and I told them, hang on a second, and men were there. In reality, that's perfect timing, isn't it? The men are there. You have a time to talk right there. And one of the men popped up and said this. I'll never forget it. I know it doesn't matter, but is he black? I couldn't believe what I heard. And I remember looking up one of the men who was a great man. And he looked like he had took a bite of a lemon. He couldn't believe what he heard either. And I was dumb that I thought, well, how can I respond to this? And I said, well, I, you know, I don't know. Because I don't think that way. And neither should a Christian think that way. You think about what he says there when he said that question. I know it doesn't matter. Obviously, that's not, not true with that person, is it? I know it doesn't matter, but are they black? You know, think about this. It wouldn't matter who he said. I know it doesn't matter, but are they Hispanic? Are they Japanese? Are they Chinese? Any one of those ideas are sinful for a Christian to have that mindset within them. Because that is not a biblical concept. That's not what we find in the New Testament. Christ went to everyone. He went to the poor, who so many of us sometimes have a hard time going and talking to. We know many times they're the first ones who will actually listen. Because their mindset is different than so many others. How would you feel if you were treated differently because of the sinful lifestyle you led in the past? 
in the past. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as, as he removed our transgressions from us. From the east is from the west. You know, I've heard people say things, well, you remember that person did all those years ago? You remember the trouble they got into? You know, you know sometimes we have to really stop and think, if they repented of it, why are we still talking about it? Why are we still dealing with that? But yet Christians sometimes are the worst about that. We take something someone has done years ago and we hold it over their head for the rest of their life. You think about that. You think about Paul, a man who was formerly known as Saul who persecuted the church. The disciples had a hard time accepting him right away because we had done in the past, but they did in the end accept him, didn't they? But they were afraid, and rightfully so, in the very beginning. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west. God has forgiven them of sins, and we should as well. If we're going to be forgiven of sins, what does Christ tell us? To forgive others their trespasses as well. How would you like it if you were treated differently because of your race? John chapter 4 and verse 9. And apparently I'm missing verses all over the place this morning. John chapter 4 and verse 9, we go back to some of verse in, in Matthew, and well, let me just back up. John chapter 4 and verse 9, what was her background? The Samaritan, he was a Jew. Why, how would you like it if you were treated differently? She obviously was used to being treated differently, wasn't she? Because she says in verse 9, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You ever heard the phrase, the wrong side of the tracks? People say, well, we don't go over there because that's a different type of neighborhood. What I mean by that is there's different culture that lives across the tracks. I remember when I was in preaching school, one of the instructors gave an example of how he was out with the brethren in a van. They were traveling around visiting, doing door knocking. And they didn't ever cross the tracks. And he asked them why. He says, well, that's a different community. What he meant by that, that's the black community. And we don't go over there. You know, it doesn't matter if it's the black community or if it's the Hispanic community or Japanese community, whatever it may be, that's still the wrong approach, isn't it? Because that's a sinful one. Let's also think about this in Matthew chapter 18. How would you like it if you were treated differently for any reason? The only godly reason a person is to be treated differently is if they have not repented of sin and they continue to live in sin. Because we find in Matthew chapter 18, and verse 17, he says, He refuses to hear them to the, to the church. He's talking about those who are refusing to hear what has happened, refusing to, to repent of sin, to change their life. They have approached him one-on-one. -on -one. They approached him with someone else. And now they're brought before the church. He says, they still won't hear that they need to repent of their sins. He says, but even, if he refuses even to hear the church... Let him to be to you like a heathen and tax collector. What does he mean by that? We are to avoid those people because they're not willing to change from their sinful way of life. And they can be de detrimental to our spiritual life as well. That's why we have to be in the world, but we don't, are not to be of the world. You think about this. If a person will not change from their sinful lifestyle has been found in sin, has been approached, has been talked to, has been encouraged to, to do what is right to make that situation correct, but it simply will not do it. You think about this, should we have any time or type of fellowship with them that shows that we are okay with their choices they have made in their refusal to repent of sins? The answer has to be no. Because if nothing has changed, has changed between me and that person, even though they're not changing their sinful lifestyle, where is the encouragement for them to change? Because obviously we're already accepting it. But if you change the way you, you talk with that person, and I don't mean harshly, I mean you no longer spend time with them like you may have in the past. Your fellowship with them has changed because of their sinful lifestyle. You know, that's the one reason for them to change because they should miss the fellowship of Christians who are following God. They should see, hey, you know, I'm missing out. Now I really need to correct this, I guess, because... I see I am in wrong. But if we embrace it, how can they see that? So how do we treat others differently? Only those who refuse to change from their sinful way of life. But it's because Christians cannot be in, 
have a type of fellowship that shows we condone those who refuse to repent of sins. What are some problems of being a respecter of persons? Treating others differently can be seen as acceptable by others. Hebrews 4 and verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. The same example of disobedience. What's one example we could think about today? We think about that example of disobedience. Treating people differently. For a vast array of reasons. He says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, that is the eternal home, heaven, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We don't want others to see our actions that are simple and say, oh, look what they're doing. That has to be okay because they're doing it. Well, that's not the case at all. When others see us treating people differently, it can become a pattern others may follow. Think about this. Think about your fathers, your grandfathers, and your great-grandfathers, and some of the mistakes they made, some of the things they did. Should we repeat them because they were our fathers and our great-grandfathers? And our, Does that mean we should do what they did because they did it and it was, must have been okay? There are some men in, in my family, and some people in my family, who have some big problems and do some things I do not condone of. And I should not, and I must not follow that example, even though they have gone, they are before me. They are older, supposedly wiser. Does that mean we should follow their example when they are doing what is wrong? Well, of course not. We cannot follow that same example of disobedience. You think about this, would you want to be avoided while others are having great fellowship? And when I say that, do we want to be avoided for no apparent reason at all? Or do we want to be avoided simply because we have a different job than some others? We have a smaller home than some others? We go to a different school than some others? You know, we think, well, that, that's really not a big deal, but yet that happens all the time. People, you won't talk or, or visit with others because their lifestyle is a little bit different than ours. Not that it's sinful, it's just different. They do things differently. They have a different job. They have different habits. They have different interests. And we treat them differently because they're not like us. Treating people differently is a sin. Thus it requires repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 9. He says, Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss for us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world is, well, I got caught. The sorrow of a Christian is, I need to change. Some of us, it may take some time for us to, to, to really accomplish that, to overcome whatever that difficulty may be, but we can change. The world just says, well, I got caught, I'll just try it differently. That's not the idea of the Bible, is it? For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Make no mistake, being a respecter of persons is sin. And what is the cure for sin? It is repentance. Repentance means making a change. If you are guilty of such, such sin, then you must change for the benefit of our brothers and sisters in Christ and for the sake of your very own soul. What does it mean when we think about the idea of practicing respect for all persons? Well, it means making changes. It means treating people better. Are we willing to change if this is a problem in our lives? Who we sit by? Are we willing to change who we eat with? Who we call on telephone? Who we visit with? This may seem small or even silly, but such changes can make big differences in how others feel if they are welcome or not. What are some advantages of the Lord's Church not being a respecter of persons? Where there is no respecter of persons, there is unity, visible unity. Psalm 133 and verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That we put aside anything we may, we think maybe because of the past that well I should treat them differently because of this that and the other. When in reality those types of reasons are unscriptural, or unchristian. 
They are not right in the sight of God. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There's nothing quite like the church being united. That is, all having the same mindset. All striving towards the same goal. The reach and save the lost and encourage one another to evangelize and to equip ourselves to defend ourselves from those who try to pull us away from God. Not only does unity please the Lord, it is also an environment for encouragement and growth for the saints themselves. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Notice that phrase, let us consider one another. Think about others, not just yourself. If we want to encourage others, we have to take our eyes off of ourselves and begin to look at the welfare, the well-being of others. And see how we can encourage them because if we aren't willing to do the very simple task of encouraging others, we're going to have a hard time being right in the sight of God. Let's consider one another in order to stir up, that is to build up, to create love and good works. You notice the first thing he says is love and then good works. If there is love between brethren, the love that comes from having unity, biblical, scriptural unity, all of those things result in good works before God. Where there, when there is no partiality being shown towards others, we become more effective workers in the community. I remember working in one area and hearing of some a denominational preacher who when a people would come in of a certain race, he'd tell them, you're welcome to stay here today, but next Sunday I think you'd be more comfortable at such and such location. What an attitude. How can we behave in such ways? And I, I remember hearing things like that all the time in that location where we were at. To the point where I was invited to come to their congregation where my wife and I were, I think, the only people there who were not African American. And they knew the congregation we were from and some difficulties we had. When we came there, they welcomed us with open arms. You know why? They didn't care where we came from. And neither should we. I'm hearing the brethren there and so was I. Very encouraged by the lesson that was able to be given there and the encouragement we had to get the fellowship, the unity we had together because we all had the same mind to reach out to the lost and to put God first and to encourage one another. And we had great fellowship together. When partiality is shown towards others, we become ineffective workers in the field for God. And would you listen to someone who treats others differently? You think about this, if you were on the other side of the trash, you saw people going door to door knocking, passing out things, talking to people, you never saw them coming over to your neighborhood, you begin to wonder why, wouldn't you? Why aren't they coming over here? Now I wonder sometimes, what would happen if someone crossed the tracks and chased you down and asked you what you were handing out? Would they just run away? You know, sometimes, I think some probably would. Let's think about this. Peter showed partiality and became known and hurt his influence for God. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 says, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him, that is Paul, to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separate himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with them, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. They'd sit down and eat with one group. Oh, here comes those of the circumcision, as the Bible says. We better get up and go sit with them. We don't want them to see us over here. Now, that sounds like some of you see it. Like, if you looked into the elementary school cafeteria, you, you expect to see things like that. But not with grown men and not with Peter. And Barnabas. But that's what happened. And you notice with Peter, his actions even affected those around him. The Bible says there in verse 13 that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. How we treat others affects how others think we should be treated, how, how they think they should be treating others as well. We have to remember as Christians that we are being watched all the time. 
not just by those around us, not just by those in our community, but also we have to remember that God is watching us. He is seeing our actions. We find in the book of Psalms, the Bible says, The Lord looks down from heaven to see if there are any who understand who seek God. The Lord is watching to see how we are living. Are we showing partiality to others for any reason? Are we showing, treating others differently because of some things that are not a scriptural reason to be treating them differently? We show the reason why we, we have to sometimes because people won't come out of their sin. But that's not partiality. That's wise judgment. If we are treating others differently, are we willing to do what it takes to change so that we can be effective as a congregation and as individuals for the cause of Christ? You know, one person can make the congregation look bad. Do we know that? One person's actions, one person's lifestyle. Others who know that person looking at the congregation, well, I know all about that church because so-and-so attends there. Mm, sometimes that's not good, is it? And we have to do our best to make sure we are putting forth our very best and being the examples we ought to be for Christ. This morning, as you think about these things, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you want to repent of your sins, confess Christ, be immersed in baptism so your sins can be washed away, and then remain faithful to God, we can have eternal life and see how God shows no partiality towards us because of our past sins, but He welcomes us as long as we repent of those things and have an obedient faith in Him. As Christians, we know sometimes that we are not perfect. We say things, we think things, we follow examples that we ought not to follow. And we can make ourselves right before God and make ourselves better people and better followers of Christ by changing and returning from those sinful ways. This morning, if you have any needs or concerns, you can come forward now. That's going to be Stan Singh to encourage you.